Hello, everyone, and welcome to the May 2023 Tarjan Center Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Jasper Estabio, Director of Training for the Tarjan Center, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Before we get started, just a couple of reminders. We do offer live Spanish interpretation, and you can click on the interpretation button, which looks like a globe on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, and select Spanish for interpretation. Please also enter your questions for our speaker into the Q&A function throughout the talk, and we'll facilitate discussion at the end of the presentation. After today's lecture, please be sure to complete our evaluation survey. We love to hear from our audience what topics you're interested in and how we can better serve the needs of the Tarjan community. The link to the evaluation survey will be sent in the chat today, as well as in a follow-up email tomorrow. And with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. All right. Hi there. Um, Dr. Joseph Jojo Armendariz is a licensed psychologist at Bridges of the Mind in West Sacramento, California. Uh, he's dedicated to helping individuals and families who speak Spanish and English. Dr. Jojo received his psychology graduate degree from the University of Rhode Island. His expertise is in the assessment and intervention of individuals with autism, intellectual disabilities, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and other co-occurring mental health conditions. Dr. Jojo's educational background includes two undergraduate bachelor degrees in human development and psychology from CSU San Bernardino. He also completed his doctoral level internship at Pacific Clinics, one of Southern California's largest community mental health clinics. After his internship, he worked as a school psychologist in the Gilroy Unified School District and the Simi Valley Unified School District for a year each. He then completed a year-long postdoctoral clinical LEND fellowship at the University of California Mind Institute in 2022. He's also a current adjunct lecturer at the UC Davis Psychology Department. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Jojo Armendariz. Thank you, Dr. Estavio, for that warm introduction. Uh, just hearing all of the things in my history, I really know how I earned a lot of the gray hairs now. So thank you so much. Um, just want to go ahead and share my slides here, and thanks everyone for attending today. Really great to be with the Tarjan Center here to share a lot of my past experiences in learning about autism as well as anxiety. So the title of today's presentation is Supporting Your Child with Autism Through Anxiety. And I use the word through intentionally because it can be a bit of a process and a bit of a journey that can require a bit of uh, reiterations and trying to get this just right. So I would love to hear from all of you as we're going along. So please put in your questions into the chat. Just a few disclosures, as I mentioned, uh, the recommendations here in the presentation are based on my professional practice. I'm also trained in one of the group examples for the therapies that we'll talk about today. It's called Facing Your Fears. We at our clinic in at Bridges of the Mind are actively recruiting participants. So just a disclosure to let you know about this. Um, and it's specifically for children with autism or on the spectrum and anxiety. Uh, there are no financial disclosures related to this presentation. So talking about where are we going today? What is our journey for this afternoon as we're gonna head into um, that in just a little bit? So. I'll talk briefly about autism spectrum disorder, about some of the rates, where we're currently at, and what does this look like, and talk a little bit more about what anxiety rates are currently, as well as uh, how that looks for children with autism, discuss some of the triggers or things that may be causing anxiety, and what are some of the best treatments out there, what to look for when you are looking for types of treatments for your child or recommendations as a therapist. Uh, additional suggestions, we'll do things that we can all practice to encounter anxiety in our daily lives and share a few resources that I love to get out there in the community and that all of you can share with others as well. If you look at this number here, one in 36 are currently diagnosed with autism. It's down from one in 44. So there's a good, good chance that many of you know somebody with autism. In schools, there are many children with autism and something that we're learning a lot more about. When you look at the full range of the spectrum, we know that autism can be uh, affecting someone in so many ways related to their thinking, related to how they talk with other people, just a bit different way of being. There might be some rigid thought patterns. So sometimes 
people in the spectrum may get stuck on something and it's a little harder to get off. Doesn't mean that they can't communicate as effectively. There's a different way of doing that. So this can just provide you with some information about autism. Uh, definitely reach out to myself or anybody within the Tarjan Center to find more resources related to autism. You may ask yourself, okay, so for children in general though, what are the anxiety rates? So what does that look like in general for children in the United States? And if you can imagine children are encountering pretty fearful things throughout the day, right now it's 10%, almost 10%, 9.4% of children encounter anxiety. And that's something that is relatable. Many kids out there, especially following the pandemic, have some more fears related to social environments, related to going out. And so thinking about ways to support all children is always important for us as we move forward. With anxiety rates specifically for children, another question you might ask, is this gonna be higher for a child with autism or lower for a child with autism? Okay, so ASD, autism spectrum disorder, the rates, what we find in the literature are rather high. So about 40% have this comorbid anxiety disorder, meaning that they have autism as well as that anxiety disorder. Even more astonishing is that some other research indicates it higher than that 40%, 42 to 79%. So it's a big number. So if you know somebody with autism, there's a good chance that there's some more fears related that are more than what you would expect for a child or an adolescent. And what is it? What does anxiety look like for children? I love this example here, this infographic. As you see, anxiety can present in a lot of different ways. Things you can visually see from children, maybe some things you can't really see that is going on inside their mind. But we can talk about anxiety, especially for younger children, as more of this irritability, aggression, sometimes feeling a little bit on edge. And that is something that for kids, they don't maybe not know how to explain yet. So when we talk to them, we teach them all of this about what is anxiety. And a definition I always go back to and learned about in my training is fear in the absence of real danger. We all have this amazing system in our mind to keep us safe, to keep us alert, that when there is something dangerous, our bodies know how to react, and we can do something. You may have heard of a term called fight, flight, or freeze, and that's part of that anxiety system. However, when the system becomes activated when there isn't a real danger, then that means the anxiety is taking over when there's no reason that the anxiety should take over, and it's keeping them from doing a lot of things in their life. So it's something we can all experience as humans, and there might be things that you think of that have been anxious moments for you. Again, though, when it takes over, the fear becomes more of that thing that's getting in your life, we would consider this an anxiety disorder. Another definition here, so it becomes a little bit more ingrained in our minds, is we think about this as an overestimation of a threat. So remember that the danger is not real that the person's going to encounter, but they overestimate, oh, that spider is going to jump out and bite me. It's probably about 10 feet away, but it's still going to do that. So you overestimate the threat. You overestimate the amount of danger that you're in. When you add that to an underestimation of your ability to cope. So I don't know what to do. I'm so scared. I don't know how to face this. Um, and that might not be something a child would say out loud, but it's kind of the same concepts that they might do or same ideas that might be going through their mind or they might run away or hide and do things that are not gonna be productive in their life. So this overestimation of threat plus the underestimation of ability to cope is equal to that anxious response. Okay? And good definition to always go back to when you think about what is anxiety? What is this thing that happens to us every day? as we move forward. I'm gonna share a video here that I find helpful when working with families and thinking about 
what is anxiety, learn a little bit more of this and something you can refer back to um, if you don't wanna watch this entire presentation, right? It's a good resource to have and directs you to more information. So let's take a moment here to watch this video and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the types of anxiety. What is anxiety? Who is affected by it? Do I have an anxiety disorder? These are common questions that about one third of American adults ask at some point in their lives. You are not, al not alone. Anxiety includes feeling uneasy, worried, and nervous with physical symptoms of stress. These happen when one fears immediate danger, or disaster, or bad luck. Anxiety is a very common and normal way people react to stress. In fact, it can be good in some situations, like letting us know when there is danger and helping us get ready for certain situations. Anxiety disorders are different from normal feelings of being anxious and include fear at a level that makes it hard to do simple activities. Knowing the signs of anxiety disorders is the first step towards making sure it does not lead to mental health problems. While many people do not seek help for anxiety, it can be treated and help is available. Anxiety disorders include generalized anxiety disorder, phobias, social anxiety disorder, panic attacks, and separation anxiety. Mental health professionals can treat anxiety using talk or behavior therapy with or without medicine. The APA is a great resource of information on anxiety. For more information, visit www.psychiatry.org. Great. So I hope you- What is anxiety? Apologize that automatically played again there. So just listing out again, the different types of anxiety that the video mentioned. Uh, these are all things that a psychologist like myself or a psychiatrist or uh, medical professionals will look at. And they're pretty common in terms of children and separation anxiety being that they don't want to separate from the parent to go to school. So it becomes a difficulty doing things that peers might do at the same age. A panic disorder, maybe in teenagers, it could look like that the body, that system, the fight or flight system is taking over and it makes it hard for them to breathe and to really focus. A generalized anxiety is just general worries about everything. So all of the things are causing them lots of that stress, overwhelming fears about doing things in their life. Agoraphobia is a specialized type of anxiety, meaning fear of open spaces, leaving home, uh, feeling like you can't escape if something did happen, okay? Then specific phobias, as I mentioned before about spiders, snakes, maybe flying or heights, those things can keep you from doing things like going to specific rooms of the house, maybe going up an escalator uh, to go to a place that you really like. That could be a fear that turns into this phobia. And then a social anxiety disorder is fear of speaking in public or being in places where you are the person having to be the leader, for example. And you may ask yourself right now, out of all of these types of anxiety disorders, which are the two or which are the ones that children on the spectrum might encounter more frequently? And if you said specific phobias and social anxiety disorders in your mind, and you know about this already, those are two common ones that we see for children on the spectrum. And we know great ways to manage this, get them through a lot of these fears. Uh, and so I'm glad to say that I've been a part of a lot of these treatments and know that want to impart the knowledge that that's out there and people can make it through this. Just a little bit more education about what anxiety looks like. And the Yerk Yerkes Dotson Law here talks about performance here on the left side and then stimulation level. And the way I always explain this is thinking of stimulation level as if you have way too much coffee and you can't focus and you're so energized or maybe you're very stressed out. And then being bored or tired, so you only maybe got a few hours of sleep, things have, you don't have enough energy to make it through something. You can imagine in both of those cases, your performance is going to be on the lower end because you might not be able to have the energy to keep up with the demands, or you might be so stressed or restless, too much energy to be able to focus and make the kind of good performance that we would expect. So there might be errors or you might drop a dish if that's ever happened to you 
you drop a dish in the kitchen and you, you maybe break something right on accident. But there's a space here in the middle where we just need a perfect amount of that stimulation. And so we do need some of that energy and that anxiety here to help us perform. And you can see it doesn't always have to be the peak performance. There's a big gap in the middle here that we can use. So it doesn't always have to be the most perfect or ideal for a child or even for us. Now, what causes anxiety? And this looks so different for every child, every person. And often you may hear about this referred to as triggers. And a trigger can be a person, a place, or a thing. And think about that in terms of where did you learn about people, places, and things? And you may have remember, oh, those are nouns. I remember that from elementary school. And that's something kids can pick up on pretty easily. And you do activities with children to talk about this in, in the context of therapy, such as what people might cause some of this anxiety? What places, such as maybe going to a crowded place like the mall or Disneyland, those are places that can cause lots of anxiety for certain children. And what things? So maybe not having access to certain preferred items like video games might cause some anxiety or worries about their getting their shoes dirty or not doing something correctly can be examples of things. I just want you to take a moment here to write down common anxiety triggers for you or even for your child. So go ahead and take a moment to put those down. Feel free to put them into the chat if you'd like. Just thinking about what are some more examples of these because they always happen. Um, I don't think that anxiety is something we can ever take away. We can all, we'll always work to reduce it and there's triggers in all of our lives and for our children as well. Now you may ask, okay, so there's lots of these triggers out there, but where are the triggers? What are the triggers for children on the spectrum? And some of the things that we've seen in groups and in the literature, fear of the dark is a big one. And we can work with that in terms of different levels of exposure to light. And then so amazing, people get creative with this. And we'll talk more about how that would work in the context of therapy. Another fear, making mistakes, right? Not getting every single problem correct. And it causes you maybe to the point of you're so worried about making the mistakes that you may make, make you may make more mistakes or you're not able to fully enjoy what you're doing anymore. Dogs, unfortunately, so they're dogs that are really nice and children may still be afraid of them. Um, and the child may not have ever had a negative experience with the dog, uh, but it still can happen or seeing animals at the zoo can be a, another trigger as well. Bees and spiders. So there's probably a few of us in here that are afraid of spiders. I'll share with you that spiders for myself, I'm pretty afraid of, but it doesn't affect me in the terms of not allowing me to do things that I like. Uh, of course, I don't think I would attend a spider fair or an insect fair if they have those out there, um, but those things can be pretty common and there's great ways to, to treat this fear. World events, as we know, things can be pretty scary at times and that we work always to minimize maybe potential access to certain news sources and to talk, talk to children openly, openly and honestly about a lot of the things happening, but also make sure that they feel safe and secure and that it's not impeding on their lifestyle. A fear of dying is some common fears or these very difficult things to put a name to, to be able to talk about. And we'll discuss a little bit more about what are we gonna focus on if a child is so afraid of dying, which we can never give them complete security about, right? It's something that's a natural process. Um, but we have ways to just focus on the here and the now and to focus on the behavior that we would like to see. Routine changes. If there's a big routine change, that's something children on the spectrum always may have difficulty with. And so there might just be increased levels of anxiety related to that. The big one too for kids in general, I see often is performing in front of others. And that is a tough one if you don't feel always as ready, or if you're so worried about how you might appear or just feeling like you just can't do it, not having the confidence, but there's lots of great ways as well to treat that. So I'd like to hear from you. I just wanna hear other 
fears you think a child on the spectrum may encounter or experience. So go ahead and put those in the chat. I'll read some off uh, to the group. Yeah, so uh, one of our participants, attendees says, yeah, making mistakes and routine changes are very big. Yeah, uh, performance, how are they performing with others? Uh, a few of you said the bees is something that happens with sudden loud noises, right? We can't always control for cars outside. We can't control for uh, a fire alarm when it is a danger, right? And so teaching them ways to cope with it, right? We want to build up that estimation of their coping strategies and teach them that they can do it. Yeah. Great. These are lots of good examples here. here. Perfection is what drives my son, right? And that's really something we hear a lot of is that perfection. They have to just get it right. Hmm. But there's ways that we can do things and not always be right. And as, as parents and practitioners out there, we can model that too. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in just a bit. But thank you all here um, for these examples. Another, I want to sh share this last one is um, being in a place for a long time. We see that the anxiety starts to increase. They don't want to spend so much time in one place. So lots of things we can work on here in the context of therapy. Then anxiety responses. So just a little bit more about this here. When you think about anxiety in terms of, as you see here on the graph, anxiety can go up, anxiety can go down, right? We, that's kind of the, always the levels in our bodies. And it happens across time because that's a constant in our life. And when we see something happen, the anxiety is low. And then one of those triggers, that person or a place or a thing comes along and it makes the anxiety spike and it goes up. Now, if the child does one of the things that they've learned to get away from it and not face the fear, what happens is an interesting component to our fear response system is that the next time that they encounter that same fear or something even similar, it just gets maybe a little bit stronger over time. And it creates this cycle where it strengthens rather than reduces the fear over time. And so we're learning ways to cope with it. We've done a good job of getting away from the fear, but we didn't do a good job of coping with it and learning how to actually handle it. Well, that's the goal of this, is we want to learn better ways to control it, to be able to face it. Doesn't have to be perfect, just get through it. So a better way to get off of this roller coaster ride and a better path forward is to actually face it, sit with the discomfort a little bit more using those coping strategies, uh, helping the adults helping to facilitate all of this, the therapist working with the child, that the next time they do face it, it's a gradual decrease of how it's affecting them over time. It doesn't go away. Remember, we can't completely turn off anxiety. Anxiety is there for all of us. That's just the way the system works, but to the point where we can make it not a disorder, right? It could just be an anxious response somewhat. We can turn down the volume of that response there. So let's get off of that roller coaster ride. We'll save the roller coaster rides for Six Flags or other places. The other thing that we can talk about in types of therapy and working with children is it's taken away from fun time. We want children to be exposed to lots of things in their life that's making them uh, better, but also having time to enjoy and relax and be with each other. So it makes them difficult for things that they care about to be there. And so you think about video games. So if they're so worried about making a mistake, they never make it past certain levels or they don't get to spend a time where they just get to relax with other people in their family. And we talk about this in ways, my previous mentor who trained me in a lot of this talked about it in terms of the world becomes smaller. And even also unfortunately can be smaller for family. It starts affecting where you can go as a family, your friends, the types of connections that you're having and making, the interests that you might have and be able to expand those interests to other things, and then social activities. Now, when we think about autism, sometimes this can be, there's a person who maybe only wants a few things and that's fine, but we also wanna make sure they have a quality with that and everyone else can be okay with it too. And so we don't want the anxiety to ever take over. 
let's talk about the treatment options. And you're asking like, we know now, I know what anxiety is. I know how it looks like. What are those triggers that happen for my child and for myself? Well, one area of treatment, and there's a lot more out there, but I wanna to focus today on cognitive behavioral therapy and talking about it as an effective first step or first try for th uh, therapy for anxiety. And there's been quite a bit of modifications as well for autism spectrum disorder and it's and it works. And so a lot of the research out there looking at randomized control trials. So if any of you know about these, the randomized control trials is really just our gold standard. The best way to look at research and understand is it really effective? Is it an effective treatment for us or for a child? And so across this uh, research article here, they looked at groups as well as individuals. And what they found across a lot of the studies that use randomized control trials were moderate effects, so meaning a pretty good effect between uh, the treatment and reducing the anxiety as based on parent ratings. So all of you, if you're a parent out there, you would have wrote a, completed a scale at the beginning and then after the treatment, the, your, the reduction of the anxiety would have went down. So pretty good effects. And then the clinicians also rated it as having a larger effect size. So showing that some pretty good effects for their perception as a, as a therapist. When you think about cognitive behavioral therapy, if you've participated in this before, you know that there's different parts of it. And for those of you who have never participated in this, one of the biggest components that a therapist does is building some rapport in that first, those first initial stages. And if you think about rapport, the word rapport really just means to uh, create a connection for allowing the child to also participate and have direction in the therapy and also be able to learn a little bit more about what their interests are. And that's really helpful for building in rewards, making it more individualized. Uh, CBT should really have that focus. Uh, psychoeducation, so knowing that all of this information, you're giving it to the child, you're teaching it to them. That way, they can be able to use it on their own, and you're also giving it to the parent, and they can help to continue this and move forward with it. That way, if there's ever anxiety again it happens, then they'll know how to work with it physical symptoms. So as we talked about before, anxiety looks like sweaty palms, heart is racing, maybe a tight face. You can see it in the child. So teaching them better ways to know about those things that are happening. They might get to watch themselves on a recording and see themselves and how they look. Restructuring those thoughts. So the thought that the, the spider is going to jump out and, and is going to hurt me, right? Oh, the spider's over there. I'm okay. So teaching those thoughts of I'm safe, I'm secure are really good ways. And just even recognizing that thought. So in context of therapy, you might have a child create that fear, what it looks like. There's a spider. We're going to squish the spider. So you make it out of Play-Doh maybe. Squish, squish, squish. That, that thought is going to be crushed. So it's a fun way for kids to get to do that. It's a hands-on approach as well. Problem solving. So thinking about therapy as a way for children to be better problem solvers, to understand that when this happens, then I may have access to more fun time, that I'm going to be okay, and better ways to, tar to reach the goals that they want to do that in their lives. Graded exposure, and I have a slide on this in, on the next slide, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's essentially the idea that when there are these fears that we have, we approach it in a way that we're going from a smaller step to a little bit bigger. So if you imagine, if you have a fear of spiders, we wouldn't put a child near the spider first, or we would definitely never tell them to start watching a lot of videos of spiders. We might just show them a, a picture of a spider, the very first step, a picture of the spider, well, like far away that they don't get to see it as much. It's not as close up. Then the next photo, the next step might be that the spider is a little closer. And then they might see a spider in a cage. And so it gets gradually a little bit more difficult. Do we necessarily need them to be holding spiders or have a, sp a spider as a pet? Probably not. I don't think that's an, a necessary step. 
but it's a way for them to just get comfortable and to use the skills that they learned in therapy to just be okay with sitting there with a the spider. Then relapse prevention, right? So all of this, all of the good work that you might do in therapy, you wanna just make sure that it continues. And so a therapist may include booster sessions um, and also checking in to see as a parent how you are doing with all of this. And then as the child keeping up with their practices. So using those coping skills, maybe practicing some of the fears again that they've over, they've already encountered and they can do it. Another visual representation of this and something you may see if you look up what is cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and sometimes this is represented in a triangle, but I like the idea of it moving in a circular pattern here. And we know that when we have thoughts about what we're scared of, it sometimes can activate our feelings, that anxious feeling, the scared feeling, and it might activate those behaviors and it can go the other way as well. So this is pretty common where we'll work with behaviors in the context of therapy to teach kids when they recognize the behaviors, when they recognize these things, they know how to change the thought, change the channel and be able to move forward. So let's look at this here uh, in terms of the CBT process in an example that one of our group members had a, uh, this was an actual case here. So one of the group members in the Facing Your Fears program had a fear of receiving gifts. And so the trigger was simple as a parent may have just pulled out the wrapping paper and a box. And then the child had these physical feelings that he was able to identify as a rapid heartbeat, a dry mouth, maybe face is tightening so parent could already see the face was scrunching up. And then behaviors of running away, the crying, the refusal that they don't want the present, or they might say, stop, no, this becoming those types of behaviors you see. Maybe some of the thoughts are what's inside of it. It's a big surprise or the change in routine. So it's, it becomes a change where they're not expecting it. And that's something really difficult to cope with. So for this example, uh, you may incorporate this graded exposure after you've taught them all about those triggers and you've talked to them about those physical symptoms. And this seems like a relative, relatively easy or moderate goal to work on in the context of therapy. And so the practical part of this is you're actually practicing, oh, let's look at videos of children receiving gifts. Or maybe we'll just look at a picture of a gift and then just have you sit there for just a few minutes and use your coping strategies in the moment. And then work your way up to slowly actually being able to receive gifts with warnings and then maybe receiving a surprise gift with no warning as you get better as you can build up that ladder of fears. So you're always going to face this a little lot of time in this type of therapy, so graded exposures. You're not going to do the hardest thing first in this type of therapy. You're going to work your way up, but with some gentle pushing along the way. And that's a fun to do with a to-do list of fears. So you can kind of have a child look at the visuals of this and see, okay, they might start with a one fear that's a little bit easier or maybe a medium-sized difficulty, and they get to cross it off. And I don't know about you, but being able to cross something off a list is really nice. And being able to have that success build over time is a big part of therapy. If you have a child with autism or you're considering cognitive behavioral therapy, there's several factors you may want to consider about is individual uh, the best for my child or should I look at an, a, a group setting? So just a few factors to consider here. We want to think about behavior. If you feel like behaviors are manageable, there's not a lot of aggression, there's going to be frustration, there's going to be some mild tantrums, right? We, we can expect that this is hard work, but if you feel like it's not going to be too disruptive to a group, then a group setting might be good for them. But if they are having a little bit more need for modification, maybe a slower pace, uh, individual setting might be the most appropriate choice. Think about our cognition, our thinking skills, being able to use the visuals on there and work with group leaders, uh, if you're in a group setting, to be able to keep up with the, all of the information. If you feel like that's something where my child might need something 
a different type of group where they've already made a lot of modifications or an individual setting where they can have a lot more individual um, focus. That might be the, the case for your child. A level of effort. I think about this in terms of what you're putting into it and how ready you are to face these things that can be a learned pattern that's going to be harder to change. So if you think about if you're not giving the best effort, it might be good a good idea to pause and then come back to it at a later time where you feel like you're in a better space to approach all of this. Parent involvement. I always express to parents when I work with them and if you come across a program that doesn't have you participate, you may wanna reconsider only because cognitive behavioral therapy for children on the spectrum really does require a lot of parent involvement. And the more you can be involved, the more you can model these skills and practice, I think the outcomes can be a lot higher and improve your chances of making gains. And then in-person versus virtual. I think this is the question we hear quite a bit after the pandemic and what's the most appropriate thing. So, um, you know, knowing your child the best in terms of how they're going to be able to, to function there. So just a little insight about what does individual CBT look like. So a typical progression of cognitive behavioral therapy can be conducted over 12 to 21 sessions and lasts approximately one hour. And then what a therapist would do is gather information related to the functional impairment, or another way of saying that is what is getting in the way of a child's daily functioning, right? And what are those barriers to all the fun things that they want to do? And then they would develop goals that they can work on. So maybe that to-do list, right? And then providing the psychoeducation, one of the big components there at each session, you're learning and building off of the new skills course, a reward system. So kids definitely need the little carrots and the motivators out there and ways for us to keep going through all of this because it is tough work. And homework, of course, is involved in being able to know that I got to keep up with my homework or it does, those skills don't really transfer. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so one of the groups that I wanted to share with you today is facing your fears. And this group here is a trained is a curriculum that I was trained in uh, two years ago uh, during my postdoc. And the sessions, as you can see, are a bit shorter than the individual sessions. However, the length of the session is a little longer. So it's about 90 minutes. Um, and then the first couple sessions, six to seven, are really focusing on those areas of CBT with psychoeducation and developing knowledge about what is it that's making me anxious, what's going on in my body. And then the latter part is really that facing your fear component. And you get a practice, group members also record themselves potentially with the families and be able to talk about this in the group setting. One thing I wanna mention with this group here is that it becomes a way for children to work on their social skills, but it's not a social skills group, but they get to practice some of those things along the way. And then the parent group, is the biggest component to this because the last part of the group, about the last 45 minutes, parents are working with each other to talk about this information. There's no kids. So it really becomes a support group with parents to be able to network also to practice the skills with each other and talk about it. Another program out there I wanna mention, if you ever see this, it's CERTS and it stands for social communication, emotion regulation, and transactional support here. And if you ever think about a comprehensive program, if you're thinking of a school setting that may be using some type of program like this, you really wanna look at all of the different areas that they're talking about generalized skills, functional academics, um, adults are working on their regulation in the classroom, and you as a parent are involved with this as well. So you may practice this at home and then looking at opportunities for spontaneous communication and lots of opportunities for play. And it's not specifically designed for anxiety, but it is a way for children to feel more comfortable. And they've shown actually reductions in anxiety with this as well and other behaviors. Anxiety medication is something you may have heard about or your children may be currently on. I like this chart here. If you ever have questions about this, you can refer back to this. 
but always be checking in. You would always want to be checking in with the doctor to be able to discuss any of these different areas. Um, but just a nice way to look at all the information related to medication and to and inform yourself about what my child is taking. Additional suggestions here, I wanted to just review some of these as we're moving forward. Uh, things that I always have in my back pocket here. So Michelle Garcia Winner has the unthinkables. Some of you may have seen this before. If not, I really am glad to share this with you. So this is called Rock Brain. And Rock Brain can take over and make you get stuck on something. But then there's the super flex thinkable that can make that Rock Brain, it can defeat it um, and make it go away and reduce it. And that is the Rex Flexinator. So each of these, the child can identify which one's taking over my brain, and then which one am I going to use here to defeat it? And those are those coping skills that they might be using. Another visual support, and you can find lots of examples of these on the internet. I'll provide some more resources at the end of my slides. But you can ask children to, to identify their worries, talk about these, and again, have a plan. So we always need these visual reminders as a good approach and it's very systematic. As you can see here, logging this too, we can call anxiety a different name. It could be anger, it could be the stress, and we can have kids rate this. You can even recreate this with different types of pictures that the kid likes or different uh, Minecraft symbols or things that they can really relate to as they're making this very unique. This one here, Cosmic Kids Yoga, is a good way to practice these skills along the way for children to use a coping skill, to even just practice being in tune with their bodies. I definitely recommend Cosmic Kids Yoga to lots of kids. Uh, cause, conscious Discipline too is another good source of visuals that are free for families to access. And this one here is the balloon breath where you blow up your stomach to have air inside like a balloon and show children that the diaphragm is expanding. And then you let it out and it kind of makes a noise that's funny that little kids especially enjoy. So just having some reminders about our coping skills out there is always a good thing for us too. And I'm see our time here. I'll, I'll share this video with everybody to give you a chance to access this on your own, but there's tons of videos online and to practice mindfulness and meditation as a coping skill to be in touch and to be able to sit there for just even five seconds, a minute, uh, and just being here in the present moment rather than focusing on what I need to do or what happened. Another big part of this, even for therapists, as adults of you, uh, children maybe out there, is how do we take care of ourselves? And this is a big question for all of us and something we continually need to work on every day and find little moments to do this. So take a moment right now, write it down. How do you take care of yourself? What are the ways that you find moments to just escape? Have that list ready for you if you ever need to remind yourself, I need a moment. And to be able to find the time to recharge your batteries. And if modeling this for your children, as well as others, can show them too that they should work on this as well. A couple more slides here about our basic needs of uh, sleep always working on getting a good amount of sleep, seven to eight hours. Some of you say, oh, I don't get that every night, but working to get it every night consistently, finding better sleep hygiene is the goal. And sleep can pay a lot of dividends or pay, um, pay off in the end as we're growing and developing, especially for our children. Eating, always finding the time to find good balance in our diet, of course, can keep us uh, going exercise. So walking you can just get out there to walk for about an hour and connecting with other people can also help us as we're moving and trying to decrease our anxiety. The relationships and connections. So having quality relationships with others, mindfulness, spirituality, and religion, being able to have those moments of connection with a higher power or be able to connect with others is uh, there's been a lot of evidence to support this as well. Therapy and counseling. So as we discuss one form of therapy here, cognitive behavioral therapy, there's many more out there. And even for parents, this can be a good way for to help you reduce your anxiety if you are experiencing that based on the anxiety of your child. A few additional resources here. Uh, my 
former supervisor, Dr. Megan Tudor, uh, and colleague here, Brianna Winder Patel, Dr. Patel here, uh, developed this recommendations for anxiety, specifically for children with autism. And I'll be able to share that with everyone. But a good reminder as well, including this presentation, a lot of parallels that you can really take forward and use to as a tool. Another book that I found along the way as I was uh, working on, these present, on this presentation and thinking about tools that are out there is Avoiding Anxiety in Aut Autistic Children, so by Dr. Luke Bearden. A lot of great resources or practical advice there. And then here's the website that I mentioned has a lot of good visuals. Lindsay Braman has fantastic neurodivergent and very affirming type of visuals that are out there, so please give that a look. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for listening today. I appreciate all of that. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Estavillo to talk, talk with you here about any questions we might have in the chat. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jojo, for that uh, very helpful and informative talk. I know that there's quite a few <laughs> questions in the chat, so this is a uh, highly requested topic here. Um, I think um, before we jump into the Q&A, um, to kind of ground us in terms of questions and um, you know things that we want to talk about um, moving forward, I'm curious on... Um, your thoughts and providing advice to parents on how symptoms of autism may impact the symptoms of anxiety and vice versa. Um, and secondarily to that, um, what, how we can support, um, you know, our loved ones through, through both. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. And I think too, that a lot of times that you can't really separate out the two, right? Anxiety symptoms and what is the autism symptoms. And what we talk about a lot of times at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter in the terms of trying to figure it out. Um, I think in a, from a research standpoint, we might want to know a little bit more. However, in the terms of treatment, we really just focus on how are this, how is it getting in the way of getting what they like to do? And always going back to that as the main concept of, um, all right, well, let's figure out better ways to um, do this. And we never want to change the child. That's always one of my sayings too, because I don't believe autism is something you never want to change. You just want to create functional um, goals for a child to live the best life possible. And I think there was a second part to that question too that I didn't answer. Do you mind yeah. sharing again? Of course, how we might support um, our loved ones through both. Yeah. And one of the key components to that facing your fears group is having that parent support group. And so it's a time for parents with no children there is a good example of this. And there's many other types of parent support groups at the Tarjan Center, at the Mind Institute up here where I completed my postdoc in Sacramento and other places that they can find to support each other. And I think that's something that I'm happy to share with other people and really glad that it's out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, um, Dr. Jojo, you had provided some excellent resources at the um, last couple slides in your talk. Um, so as a reminder to our audience that the um, presentation recordings, as well as the slides will be available on our website in just a couple of weeks. Um, so you'll have access to all the wonderful resources that Dr. Jojo has provided. Um, another question that I'm curious about um, and kind of transitions us into some of the questions in the chat are, um, you know, related to this concept of alexithymia or difficulty identifying and describing emotions, which can be common amongst individuals on the spectrum, um, mm -hmm. particularly with struggling with um, identifying those physical symptoms. Uh, do you have any suggestions or strategies for those of us in the audience on how to support individuals on the spectrum who might have that extra difficulty with um, the physical sensations and the emotions part of the CBT triangle? Yeah, so powerful to think about sometimes if that's an area we don't have a good connection with the, the technology we have nowadays to be able to record. Everybody has this computer in their hand with a phone, right? So be able to practice some of these to have kids look at seeing some of these things or maybe using some type of uh, visual cue, like you can think of body paint um, or some other types of things that you can get really creative with. Um, maybe putting stars right here so they can see if it 
um, squishes up into a little tiny star when their face crunches up to kind of connect that back to the vocabulary of those types of emotions, right? And so it's all about being able to identify and connect with what's going on in the body. And so it just might need a little bit more visual support as well as these other technological things. And I think about this in terms of what is AI going to eventually help us with? I know that's another presentation in and of itself, but I think that's another future for us to, to look at as well. Absolutely. I, I love that suggestion of utilizing the resources that we already have um, to help teach these skills, whether it's, um, you know, stickers or all of the visual aids that you had described earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's so powerful for us as practitioners or loved ones to model for others. Just like, I'm feeling really stressed. My shoulders are up by my ears right now. Yeah. Um, just being able to label that for others um, mm -hmm. and show that, you know, feelings and emotions aren't they in themselves scary. Um, it's what we can do to manage them and work through, which I love how that was part of your title, your title um, to work through those emotions to help ourselves feel better. Yeah. Um, some other questions, I think I'm just, um, you know, compiling some types of questions together um, would uh, be related to, are there different strategies that you recommend based on either age or varying needs of the individual? So for example, um, individuals who are minimally vocal or mm -hmm. who are a lot older and have different, you know, uh, demands and their social um, social needs. Um, so are there different strategies that you can re recommend for our audience based on different kinds of needs for the individual? Yeah, and one example I think about if you were to look at facing your fears, the creators of that program have already developed are in the works of developing different levels for individuals who have different processing differences. Mm -hmm. Um, even a younger group where they might incorporate more visuals, more play-based activities, right? Mm -hmm. So always thinking about where is my child at? What's going to serve them the best? Because if we were to, I know for myself, if you give me calculus to do right now, it would cause me lots of anxiety. I wouldn't be at that level, right? I'm not an <laughs> expert in that. So always thinking about how do we meet the child where they're at? and to be able to provide them with the adequate resources that are not too difficult and maybe just easy enough for them to get some good success. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a process, right? It doesn't, you try it one time, it might not work, but you can come back to the drawing board after a little bit of time. And that gives them more um, confidence. Cause I actually have seen that before where children maybe weren't ready for the group at one point, but they come back and they feel like, oh, I've done this before a little bit. And they become like a leader and you see that growth. Right. Really, yeah. really coming back to uh, that saying that if somebody's not learning how we teach, we got to teach how they learn, right? Providing additional supports, whether it's visual yeah. or um, in vivo practice um, is really powerful and just meeting that individual where they're at. Definitely. Um, I have some other kinds of questions in here from, it seems like some practitioners on, uh, you know, basic, maybe some mindfulness strategies or ways in a group um, or maybe in an individual setting that you can start off some sessions with. Um, any recommendations there? Yeah, what's always fun to do, I think, too, is do a little bit of the practice and modeling it, but then you allow children to show us their interesting ways to breathe. I've seen all kinds of new methods of breathing where remote control breaths. So press the X and take a deep breath in, press the Y, let it out. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so genius. Mm -hmm. um, and so then there's different ways that children can build that in and their interests too. So if they really enjoy an animal, they can like a stuffed animal they have, they can practice with that and show the group. And coming back to more visual hands-on approach, I'm always a big fan of multi-sensory. So mm -hmm. trying things in different senses in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. And so, um, I think in our last talk, we, um, 
also talked about some different resources with um, various ways of breathing. So using like a pinwheel to show us how we can take that long exhale, belly mm -hmm. breathing, uh, breathing with a stuffed animal, box breathing, lazy eight breathing. There's lots of different resources that are available um, for our audience. If you just want to do a quick search using some of those terms, this can be very powerful. Um, progressive mm -hmm. muscle relaxation can also be so helpful for many of our um, young ones who, um, you know, they <laughs> tend to tense up and not notice when their bodies are uh, really tense. Um, mm -hmm. I think I have a question here, which I think um, a lot of people can relate to is um, if you have a child or an adolescent um, or an individual really who um, might be resistant to change um, or to working on some of these things, um, you know, avoidance and anxiety is very powerful. Um, but any recommendations or supports for our um, audience in terms of how to, um, you know, gently nudge someone towards uh, being more open to receiving help? Yeah, and it's interesting too, where the treatment can also be the fear of that it could be the anxiety where that's actually you're going to work on exposing a child to the treatment. So you can even think about it in that graded approach where maybe the parent is on screen and the child is for the first couple sessions to the side, you know, if we're thinking of a virtual format and then just a little bit, like we have a half of a face of a child, we get to see them participate mm -hmm. in the next couple of sessions and just slowly warming up. And another reason why I put in the medication slide is I think it's important to know that there are lots of children with anxiety that may need those types of medications. And that's why it's important to talk with the doctors about it. And we know that the combination of medications as well as therapy uh, can be an approach for some children and some families to consider. I'm just always thinking about that as well. And then knowing too that it might not be the right time for therapy. They might need to work on maybe something that could be a little bit more play-based potentially um, or fewer demands in the moment. And then let's try it again. Let's bring it back and always having some rewards for them too along the way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's a nice reminder for uh, the caregivers and others in the audience that, um, you know, learning, learned behavior, it's taken a long time for people to learn these strategies that can be adaptive, like anxiety is adaptive. So unlearning um, is going to take some time too. And that's okay, right? To take the time to expose people to the strategies that might be more helpful. Um, I always remind the families that I work with that, you know, our brains are evolved to be very efficient, <laughs> uh, but not necessarily correct or kind. Um, and that's when, that's when anxiety and a lot of other challenges comes into play. Um, and so being able to work on those skills in a therapeutic session can be very helpful there. Yeah. Um, I am noticing time. And so Dr. Jojo, just I wanted to wrap things up with, um, you know, if there are additional resources or ways that our audience can contact you um, and, you know, what's next for you, ways that we can, uh, you know, reach out to you or if there are other groups that you're running, um, you know, all of those kinds of things, where can we find you, um, you know, for next steps? Yeah, I'll definitely share my contact information. I have my email through UC Davis. I'd um, love to share some of the resources through the Bind Institute. I'm grateful for the training I received there um, and my former colleagues there. So always really promoting that. And there's a lot of Spanish resources as well. There's a Spanish parent group that they hold each month. And so I can provide that information. I saw some individuals here that are streaming in from uh, Latin American countries. So I want to be able to have them come to those sessions virtually as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Jojo, for being here with us today and providing us with such a wealth of information and resources. Um, for our audience, um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to um, reach out to the Tarjan Center um, and we can pass along those questions to Dr. Jojo. Um, the talk recording will be available in both English and Spanish um, in just a couple of weeks on our website, as well as the um, copy of the slides. So you will have access to all those resources 
resources. Um, additionally, we do have our plain language podcast called In Other Words, which Dr. Jojo will be featured on, um, and that will be available wherever you stream your podcast nowadays. Um, and to our audience, thank you so much for being here with us today. Again, Dr. Jojo, it's been such a pleasure being able to chat with you. I always love getting to work with you and um, you know see all the amazing things that you're doing. Uh, so we're looking forward to all the exciting things ahead for you. Um, and I hope to see our audience during next month's lecture on Monday, Monday, June 12th. We'll see you all there. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.